In June 1942, Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands, seizing Attu and Kiska. These were among the last territories Japan would seize in the Pacific Ocean. The army wanted them seized to break up any offensives against Japan from the area, placing a barrier between America and Russia, and to be used as a base for an attack into Alaska. However, the islands were a strategic backwater. Instead of giving Japan an advantage in the war, the seizure of both islands kept the carriers Junyo and Ryujo away from Midway and contributed to Japan's defeat there. In 1943, the Americans concentrated forces to retake Attu and Kiska. While the islands were not strategically important, it was American territory. In May 1943, Attu was secured after a ferocious battle. Emperor Hirohito fell into despair after the defeat, and in a meeting asked army and naval officers, isn't there some way, some place where we can win a real victory over the Americans? With Attu gone, that left Kiska as Japan's last bastion in the Bering Sea. By June 21st, American aircraft was taking off from Attu and bombarding Kiska. Japan tried to use submarines to get the garrison out, but two were sunk and one was run aground. In July, American warships began to shell Kiska. The Kuril's Islands, Japan's northernmost territory, were also shelled and bombed by aircraft. In this desperate situation, Shiro Kawase, the commander of Japan's 5th Fleet, decided upon a bolder plan. Kawase had been sent to 5th Fleet after Boshiro Hosegaya was defeated in March 1943 in the Battle of the Komandorsky Islands. Kawase had been commanding ships since 1911 and was an expert in destroyer tactics and convoy operations. He decided after the loss of submarine I-7 that only surface ships could get the garrison to safety. He had already failed though to save Attu's garrison, but he was determined to rescue the men of Kiska. However, American aircraft constantly patrolled the area and PT boats kept watch over the island. The nearly 6,000 Japanese on Kiska appeared to be doomed. On July 22nd, an American PBY aircraft picked up seven radar pips headed east. Thomas Kincaid, the theater commander, believed Kao Se was making a run to save Kiska's garrison. To intercept this force, Kincaid sent Robert Giffen with battleships New Mexico, Mississippi, and Idaho, with the cruisers Portland, Wichita, Louisville, San Francisco, and Santa Fe, and also nine destroyers. Giffen was nicknamed Ike, and was a favorite of Ernest J. King. He commanded escort forces in the Atlantic in 1942 and took part in the Murmansk run and participated in Operation Torch. However, when sent to the Pacific, he lost the heavy cruiser Chicago off Rennell Island. He was considered tactically inflexible and lacked an understanding of air power, which contributed to Chicago's loss. William Halsey despised him, but Chester Nimitz gave him major forces in the North Pacific. At 12.45 a.m. on July 26, the battleship Mississippi's radar detected seven targets. They were 15 miles to the northeast and proceeding at 16 knots. The reading was independently verified by radar on board the battleship New Mexico and the cruisers Portland and Wichita. Giffen closed the distance at 24,000 yards and ordered all ships in radar contact to open fire. For 67 minutes, the Mississippi, New Mexico, and the cruisers Portland, Wichita, and Louisville fired wildly into the night. When the pips faded, the shooting stopped. Yet no wreckage was seen. The Americans had fired into a seemingly empty ocean. The action was later dubbed the Battle of the Pips. To this day, no one knows what set off the radar. The Navy's official explanation was an atmospheric phenomena, likely radar echoing off the mountains, in particular Kiska's volcano. This is unlikely though given the radar pips were numerous and seemed to converge. The bad weather also could have created false radar returns, although when this occurs it is rare for several ships to also pick up false returns. Recent evidence suggests that it was flocks of sooty shearwaters or short-tailed shearwaters which fly through the area in July and are known to set off radar. Some thought it was Japanese submarines. There were 11 such vessels in the area and there is some evidence that submarines had to submerge while under fire. However, this theory cannot be confirmed due to lack of hard evidence. 
The biggest culprit was the bad weather, which forced the Americans to rely on radar. The operators were inexperienced, on edge, and using a new technology. Always a recipe for error. Off on Kiska, Japanese soldiers watched the explosions in the distance, thinking it was a naval battle that would decide their fate. Well, in a sense, the Japanese soldiers were correct. Giffen's task force had to leave to replenish their ammunition. Soon after, a terrible snowstorm forced the PT boats to leave Kiska. Kawase, seeing his opportunity, launched a daring evacuation. He sent Masatomi Kaimura with the light cruisers Kiso and Abukuma and nine destroyers. Kaimura was an experienced destroyer commander and considered among the best at handling ships. However, in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, his forces were shredded by aircraft. He was badly wounded and his surviving ships sent to the quieter 5th Fleet. On July 28th, Kiska's garrison was evacuated, with some 5,183 men boarding the ships in 55 minutes. Kaimura then sped away, reaching Paramushiro in the Kuril's Islands on August 1st. The evacuation went undetected, and the Americans thought there were 10,000 men on Kiska. As such, Operation Cottage was ordered forward with 34,000 American and Canadian troops, even more than were used at Atu. They were supported by nearly 170 aircraft. They were also supported by the battleships Pennsylvania, Idaho, and Tennessee, two cruisers, 19 destroyers. All would shell Kiska. The invasion was set to August 15th. Some thought the Japanese had left due to a fall off in radio traffic. Yet, aircraft reported occasional flak fire. It was decided the Japanese had retreated to Kiska's higher ground, which was covered in continuous fog. Meanwhile, most pilots figured out the island was abandoned. In early August, a flight of P-40s landed at Kiska. The pilots walked about and took photos. Kincaid attacked anyway. He wanted to be careful, but also told his subordinates Kiska would make for a super dress rehearsal, good for training purposes. On August 15th, the Americans landed, followed by the Canadians on August 16th. That same day, the Navy shelled an empty Kiska. The island was draped in fog and there were friendly fire incidents. Japanese mines and booby traps were also plentiful, and so was graffiti mocking the Americans. The troops did find Explosion, the pet dog of Kiska's US Navy weather team. While the team was captured in 1942, Explosion had managed to survive on Kiska for months. By August 17th, Kiska was declared liberated. Total Allied casualties were 22 killed and 174 wounded, nearly all of them American and due to friendly fire. Kincaid said, Of course we had no way of anticipating our men would shoot each other in the fog. On August 18th, destroyer Abner Reed struck a Japanese mine in Kiska Harbor, killing 70 and wounding 47 bringing total losses to 313. The ship lost its stern and nearly sank. Abner Reed, though, survived, only to be lost the next year in a kamikaze attack. Many were glad there was no battle for Kiska, as that too had been one heavy cost. In addition, the Americans found the wreck of the Japanese submarine I-7 and recovered code books from the vessel. However, the Battle of the Pips and Operation Cottage were seen as an embarrassment. Across the Pacific, Japanese radio played up the evacuation and mocked the Americans. Time magazine dubbed Kiska a Janfu, a joint Army-Navy foul-up. American General Simon Buckner concluded that Kiska was a great, big, juicy, expensive mistake. 